Hello students. So last time we learned about the price elasticity of demand conceptually. Now we'll go into the mathematics. So the method we'll talk about here is called the midpoint method. It's an approximation. If you go and take intermediate micro, you'll see a calculus based formula that's going to be more precise. So what we do is we take two neighboring points on the demand curve and we use this approximation. So the price elasticity of demand, which your book calls ED, will be percent change in Q over percent change in P. We get that by looking at change in Q over average Q. That gets divided by change in P over average P. Remember Q is quantity, P is price. So to be clear, this is the average for two neighboring points on the demand curve. It's not the average of all the points in the demand curve. Just pick two. Same for price. You're averaging two neighboring prices, not all the prices. An example will clarify shortly what I mean by that. So one thing to watch out for, your elasticity of demand should always be negative or an extreme case could be zero if you have perfectly inelastic demand. It should never be positive though, because that would break our law of demand. Law of demand tells us that if something gets more expensive, people buy less of it. In other words, price and quantity move in opposite directions. That gives you this negative relationship. So I promised to give you guys an example clarifying about the stuff about neighboring points on demand curve. So here's our example. Let's say when price is 30, is 3, quantity is 10, when price is 2, you have a quantity of demand of 20, and so on, as our table describes. So I'll start by finding the elasticity for these two points. So I'll pick the price 3, quantity 20, so the price 3, quantity 10 point, and also the price equals 2, quantity equals 20 point, and just work with those for my initial calculation. So here the quantity goes down by 10, Go from 20 to 10, so that would be a negative 10 over there. Price goes up by 1 from 2 to 3. It's an increase of 1. So that's why I have a change in P of 1 over here. Now I stressed on the earlier slide that by average quantity, I mean the average of those two points. I don't mean the average of all the points. So I'm working with just those two points. I'm averaging 10 and 20. That works out to 15. So again, we're not averaging these four guys. That's not what you want to do. Just these two. Likewise with price, we're averaging just these two prices. Average of 2 and 3 is 2.5. So we've got all of our ingredients together. Let's plug them into our formula up here. So change in Q over average Q, that's minus 10 over 15. Minus 10 over 15. So that works out to uh, minus 2 thirds. Change in P over average P, that's 1 over 2.5. That's going to be um, 2 fifths. So we have 2 thirds, sorry, we have negative 2 thirds over 2 fifths. And that works out to minus 5 over 3. So that's how you get your first elasticity. So now you know how that works. So with that ex experience in hand, go ahead and try to calculate the elasticity for these other possibilities as well. So try to find the elasticity for these two points. Then also find the elasticity for these last two points. So go ahead and pause the video, make those calculations. When you think you're ready, press play and we'll see if you're right. All right, so I'll assume you've given that some thought by now. Let's work through the math. 
So for these two points, quad A goes down by 10 from 30 to 20. That's a minus 10 over there. Price goes up by one, so change in P is one. For average quantity, we average these two points. An average of 20 and 30 is 25. So that goes over here. For average price, we average these two prices. Average of one and two is 1.5. So that goes over here. Put all the ingredients together. So changing Q, changing Q over average Q, that's going to be minus 10 over 25, so minus 2 fifths. Changing P over average P, 1 over 1.5, that's 2 thirds. Minus two fifths over two thirds works out to minus three fifths. All right, last part of our example. So look at we're going to look at these two points over here. Quantity goes down by ten, so going from forty to thirty is a decrease of ten. Price goes up from zero to one, so. Change in P is positive 1. We average together those two points, 30 and 40. That gives us 35. We average together the prices, 0 and 1. That's 0 0.5. Last step, we do change in Q over average Q and change in P over average P. Change in Q over average Q is minus 10 over 35. So that'd be, um, minus 2 over 7. Change in P over average P is 1 over 0.5. That's 2. Minus 2 over 7 divided by 2 is minus 1 over 7. So there is your elasticity. Now, to be clear, elasticity is not quite the same thing as slope. So in general, a good that has elastic demand will have a relatively flat slope, but the slope is the same as the is not the same as the elasticity. So if you graph this demand curve that we just worked with, have price of three corresponding to a quantity of ten that's over here, price of two, quantity of twenty, price of one, quantity of thirty. You get this linear demand curve, so the slope is constant. While slope is constant, the elasticity varies. So don't conflate slope and elasticity. They're similar, but they're not the exact same thing. Here is the other side of that. So this graph, which I generate according to some mathematical formula, has a constant elasticity. It's generated from what's called, I believe it's called an isoelastic demand curve isoelastic preferences, which we won't go into here, but you can create a demand curve that has constant elasticity. As you can see, though, the slope is not constant. The slope is kind of flat-ish out here and steeper over here, though the elasticity is the same throughout. So it just drives home that elasticity is not quite the same thing as slope. So you can categorize demand based on the price elasticity. We said that in the previous episode that perfectly inelastic demand looks like this. It means that no matter how high or how low price is, people still buy the same amount. In other words, demand does not respond at all to price. It's completely insensitive. So if the price elasticity is change in Q, sorry, percent change in Q over percent change in P, and Q never changes, that's going to be percent change of zero. Zero divided by P is going to be 
zero. So that's why zero always corresponds to perfectly inelastic demand. So that's one case. Another possibility is that the elasticity could be less than zero, but greater than negative one. That gives you demand that we call relatively inelastic. So let's say you had an elasticity of minus 0.6. What that means in plain English is that if prices go up by 1%, then people buy 0.6% less. So the change in quantity is less than change in price. You don't get a one for one response. You get a less than one for one response. So it, it, is, it is responding, but just not by very much. It's not very sensitive to price. If demand is kind of insensitive to price, we call that inelastic. So intermediate case is called unit elastic demand. That's when a demand elasticity is minus one. That gives you this one for one change. So if prices go up by 1%, people buy 1% less. Next possibility is relatively elastic demand. That's where demand is less than negative one, but it's still finite. As an example, consider an elasticity of demand that is negative two. So if prices go up by 1%, people respond by buying 2% less. That's a more than one for one response. That means that people are sensitive to price and they care about price quite a bit and they do change their behavior substantially when price changes. So if demand is very responsive to price, we say demand is relatively elastic. Last possibility, perfectly elastic demand. That corresponds to an elasticity of negative infinity. So 1% increase in price would cause quantity demanded to go all the way to zero. So the percent change in Q can be infinite. That gives you infinity over some number in our formula. So infinity over a number is going to be infinity. So that must be the perfect elastic case. So the elasticity of demand has implications for a firm's revenue. So recall our very, very important law of demand back from chapter three. That says that if price gets higher, people buy less. Now elasticity tells you how much less, that you'll buy a lot less or they only buy a little bit less. So if a firm tries to raise its price, they're going to end up selling fewer units because of the law of demand. The question then comes down to, do you sell a lot less or do you sell only a little bit less? That can tell you what's going to happen to your revenue. So if demand is elastic, then quantity responds a lot to price. So lowering your price can raise total revenue. So this is the graph that's borrowed from your textbook. Originally, we had a price of $4. We only sold one unit when we had a price of $4. $4 per unit times one unit translates into $4 of revenue. Later on, the firm decided to cut prices. Now the price is three instead of four. Because demand is very sensitive to price, people responded by doubling their consumption. Now they're buying two units instead of buying just one. So now if you're selling two units for a price of $3 each, you're getting $6 of revenue. $6 of revenue is bigger than $4, which you were getting before. Your book is showing that you lost this $1 over here because you have less revenue per unit. However, 
you gain that back with extra because you're selling more units. Now, watch out for a possible trap here. You might have the impression that when demand is, is elastic, you always want to cut prices. That's not necessarily true. A firm's goal is not to maximize revenue. Firms try to maximize profit. So yeah, we got more revenue when we sold more units. However, we also probably incurred more costs. Were those extra costs worth it? You gotta do some more math to figure it out. So you can't assume that you always wanna cut prices when demand is elastic. You also have to consider the cost side. Beware of misconceptions. So let's talk about unit elastic demand. That's where the elasticity was one. In that case, a 1% change in price caused a 1% change in quality, so it's going to exactly offset, and your revenue will be unaffected. So here the firm had a price of three, and they sold two units. $3 per unit times two units translates into $6 of revenue. If they cut prices to $2, they sell three units. $2 per unit times three units comes out to still $6. So you sold more units, but then you lost revenue per unit. Those effects exactly offset when demand was unit elastic. So you still have the same total revenue. Now, last case, if demand is inelastic, then cutting prices loses revenue. So here we have a price of $2 per unit and we sell three units. Two times three is six, so $6 in revenue. If you cut prices, consumers respond to that by buying more, but they only buy a little bit more. Now you're selling four units instead of three. $1 per unit times four units is $4 in revenue. Revenue goes down from $6 to $4. So $2 net loss in revenue. Now in this case, actually, we can say unambiguously that the firm would not want to do this if they have influence over price. Why is that? Just a few slides ago, I said you could not assume that you always want to cut prices when demand is elastic, but now I say you can't make an assumption when demand is inelastic. There's actually no contradiction. The more you produce, the higher your costs. So to make this happen, producing three units and then producing four units instead, you had to make more, which means you have higher costs. If you have higher costs and you also have lower revenue, that's a recipe for lost profit. So earlier, a couple slides ago, you gained revenue, but you also gained costs, so it's not clear if that was worthwhile. Here, you're losing revenue, you're also adding costs, so both of those make your profit go down. So this is a bad idea. So recall from chapter three, we said market power was the firm's ability to influence price. So a firm is like a monopoly. They would never want to make this happen. Now, some firms in very competitive industries have little or no influence over price. So they have to be forced to do this anyways. But if you have market power, if you can control a price, you would not want to cut prices when demand is inelastic. So that wraps up our section on the price elasticity of demand. Be sure to tune in for our next episode and we'll learn about income elasticity.